Uh, welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Such Egan. Today we're in for a real treat. I have the distinct privilege of welcoming my friend and former professor, Dr. Phil Keston. Uh, Dr. Keston is the Associate Professor of Physics and Vice Associate Vice Provost for Undergraduate Studies at my alma mater, Santa Clara University, and I'm excited to welcome him now for the Physics of Star Trek. Thank you, Dr. Keston. Thank you. Uh, well, this is the place that we have to start, I think. Um, this is one version, for, the, for those of you that are, uh, you know, uh, somewhat uh, uh, Trek geeks, you'll know that this is just one of the versions. Uh, the first one said where no man has gone before. The uh, network decided that was inappropriate at some point. But um, really, this sets the, the tone for Star Trek. Uh, what we want to focus on is where they wanted to go or needed to go, how far away, how fast they needed to go, uh, because that demanded some science and technology shoot that was unheard of uh, when Star Trek started in the mid-60s. And um, I don't know why it says 2014 there. That's bad on my part, because 2016, it's still weird and strange and unbelievable. So uh, where will we go today? Uh, spend just a few minutes talking about Star Trek, although I hope that you know what it is. <laughs> Talk a little about the technology and the science, the physics of Star Trek. Uh, I'll take a, a brief look around, spend a little bit more time on a holodex and on warp drive, and then I'll offer you some conclusions. But first of all, we have to say, as you know, Star Trek is deeply embedded in our culture. Um, I, I think this picture sums it up. Here we see Einstein, Hawking, Newton, and Data playing poker. Um, seems perfectly natural, don't you think? Deeply embedded in our culture? Absolutely. Uh, how many of us have used some, perhaps all of these? Um, He's dead, Jim. You know, that's one of my favorites. Uh, and of course, I'm a doctor, not a physicist. Well, I can't use that one. But. <laughs> Let's take a look at our old friends. These are all uh, the publicity shots uh, from the series. Here they are from the original series. Sadly, so many have left us now. Star Trek, a real franchise, yes. Uh, the Next Generation, late earlys into the 90s. Deep Space Nine came along in the 90s. We had Voyager and finally Enterprise. And lots of movies. In fact, the next movie, you probably didn't know this, I'm gonna guess, <laughs> is coming out in two days. <laughs> yeah, uh, and there's a new TV series that'll be uh, coming out in January. Uh, you know, you may not know this. This is not germane to the Star, the physics of Star Trek, but uh, Paramount sold most of the rights of Star Trek to CBS, um, and CBS is coming out with a new TV show in January. But they're very clever. They're going to show you the first one on public television, but all the rest of the episodes you're going to have to pay for CBS access to see. I'm going to pay. Um, <laughs> and this is just an aside, but I don't know what you guys think. I love the, the reboot. I love the J.J. Abrams reboot. And, I mean, to me, this just says it all. I mean, come on, look at these two guys. They're the same, same person, right? Old Kirk and New Kirk. Why are we so captivated by Star Trek? Why were we so captivated in the 60s? by Star Trek. In answer, I offer these two photographs. Where were they taken? California? Asia? Someplace we don't know? Well, I know the first one for sure. I took it. I took it in Colorado, in Rocky Mountain National Park, up at 12,000 feet. The second picture, well, I didn't take that one. That was taken by the Opportunity Rover on Mars. Yeah, 
I mean, when you think about it, there are places that are things that are not on this earth that are like earth. And I think that's what captivates us. Hey, you know what? On Mars, there was once water flowing. On, on, the, on the left, your left, a stream on earth. On the right, what's left of a stream on Mars. And you know what? We find the same kind of conglomerate, these little chunks of, of pebbles rounded by water flow stuck together. We find the same thing on Mars that we find on Earth. Water once flowed on Mars. Oh, wait a second. Water still flows on Mars. <laughs> this is a picture taken on the rim of Hale Crater on Mars. And you notice these streaks that are coming down, these streaks. Well, you might say, yeah, yeah, okay, I could believe that was water flowing once upon a time, but these streaks change. In 2015, just last year, NASA was taking pictures of this same region, and those streaks change over time. The temperature there is warm enough that the, that the frozen ice in the permafrost melts. Sometimes explosions of steam come up from the surface. Can you imagine that? And look at this picture. This is Mars at sunset. You could almost imagine looking out toward the hills, toward the ocean, and seeing this here in Silicon Valley. So I think this is why we're captivated by Star Trek, because we're tantalized by the fact that there's a, there's a universe out there which is something we can almost put our fingers on. Now let's talk about the science and technology. First of all, you must know that the creators of Star Trek were amazingly prescient. They got so many things right. I mean, here's, here's one of the things that you may not know, and I, I love this. Uh, uh, one of my favorite episodes of the original series, Yesterday and Tomorrow, um, they, uh, they, come in, uh, they, 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 they come in contact with something they called a, a black star. What was it? It was a black hole. Now, shoot, if we had a movie today and we talked a lot about black holes, which we do, nobody would, would say anything. The physicist who coined the term black hole did it two years after that episode was made. Right? These guys were getting a lot right. And it's not exaggeration, an exaggeration at all to say that their vision of the future in many ways drove the development of science and technology that we have today. I'll show you some examples. Uh, well, there's, uh, there's um, Ohora wearing a Bluetooth headset, and uh, you'll have to use your imagination in this big white area. Star Trek personnel looking at a desktop computer. That image I got, it was one of the promo images from the original pilot in which Major Barrett was playing number one, second in command, and it was a very young Leonard Nimoy. Flat panel monitors? We think nothing of it these days. 1960, oh my gosh. 1965, 1966, TVs were this big and this deep. Uh, and there's uh, Captain Kirk walking through a door that opens automatically for him. I don't know if any of you ever heard him say this, but Neil deGrasse Tyson, when asked you know, what he found amazing about Star Trek when he was a kid, he said the thing that amazed him most was the doors that opened when you walked <laughs> through them. Right? Jim Kirk using a flip phone. A lot of date now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, what was he thinking? You know? Come on. <laughs> and uh, there's Riker working on his tablet. Um, I guess it probably, here, it, it, it wouldn't be an, um, an iPad, would it? No. No. Shh. That's the technology. What about the science? Turns out, well, first of all, clearly there's lots of physics, lots of science in Star Trek. We'll spend a little time talking about the different pieces. Is it right? Is it wrong? Good or bad science? For example, mirror universes. What do you think? I mean, is that it's just a fanciful science fiction? Or could there really be mirror alternate universes. Turns out, 
in theory, okay. I mean, this is Brian Green talking here. Brian Green from Columbia who's become like, you know, one of the, I think of as one of the Carl Sagan's of today, you know, one of the public faces of physics. And basically what he says here is, hey, if the universe is infinite, why wouldn't we have an infinite number of ways to combine the infinite number of things we have in this universe? So mere universe is allowed in theory. Oh, tractor beams. Oh, we've seen this a million times in Star Trek and also other science fiction uh, movies and such. You know, the, the ship needs to grab a hold of something or somebody or an attacking ship. They, they send out that tractor beam and they grab hold. Oh, come on, that can't be right. I mean, how could you possibly imagine doing that? When I first started to talk about the physics of Star Trek, I, in fact, uh, I, I said, come on, that's, that's got to be just science fiction. Turns out, it's not. In fact, we are using tractor beams today. Okay, you're not going to go out and grab a spaceship with a tractor beam today. But with the equivalent, the optical equivalent of a tractor Tra uh, tractor beam, which folks call either optical tweezers or single beam gradient traps, by taking two or more laser beams and focusing them in a certain way, you can grab hold of an object. An object how big? Mm, maybe on the size of cells. <laughs> and move them around. People have also learned how to do this with focused sound waves. These are called acoustic tweezers. So check this out. Here are five images of, um, in this particular case, it's, a, it's called a, a vesicle. It's a, a substructure with inside an algae cell. Algae cells tend to be pretty large. And uh, these are five images taken over the course of 260 seconds. If you look closely, you can see that, well, it's a little hard to see, but there's some structure in the cell that's not moving. The only thing that's moving is this vesicle. And it's because it's been grabbed by um, one of these optical tweezers and moved around. People uh, can do this with um, single atoms all the way up to uh, uh, nanotubes. Um, uh, w there's some very cool pictures out on the web. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the uh, permission to use them, so you'll have to go search the web for them. But there's this tool called Google. That they can, they can use. Oh, cool! I gotta learn. I gotta learn about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wormholes. Real physics, goofy. Which? Well, there's some special cases. <laughs> Special cases? So you're saying it, it's okay? Maybe wormholes? Yeah? Yeah, turns out, in theory, there's nothing wrong with wormholes. We don't know how to make them yet. We haven't seen any yet. But the theory allows for them. What are they? They're kind of like shortcuts through space-time. So I could get from here to here without going through all the stuff in between. Uh, this requires a higher dimension. Uh, the way I like to think of it is this. Um, the Earth, well, let me ask you. How many dimensions do we live in? How many dimensions is this? <laughs> now you're all wrong. <laughs> it's two. Come on. It's two. I mean, I rarely go up and down. I mean, once in a while, but, right? And so, for example, if you want to fly from here to mm, Athens, you get on your plane, oh, maybe you go up a little bit, but basically you go in a, a curved plane. Only when you realize that the Earth is three-dimensional do you think, hey, you know what, I could drill a tunnel from here to Athens. It would be a lot faster, a lot straighter. But I need that higher dimension to do that. Right? And that's, this is what wormholes will allow us to do if, if we can access that higher dimension. We'll talk about the higher dimensions uh, in just a bit. So wormholes, OK. <laughs> Time travel. 
I mean, that's got to be science fiction, don't you think? Any, anybody going, going with me on the ride with, with, for time travel? Can't, can't possibly be good science, right? Go forward. Huh? We are all time traveling right now. Well, this, in fact, is... <laughs> this is what I say. <laughs> but only one speed. You know, one second per second, right? That's it. With some variance. Well, yeah, except... Here's the thing, and Einstein understood this uh, more than 100 years ago. Because the speed of light is absolute, by that I mean uh, if, if I run alongside of a light beam, the light beam is still moving at the speed of light with respect to me, even if I'm going fast. Because the speed of light is absolute, clocks in relative motion to each other run at different rates. So if, if I've got a clock in my hand and somebody else, oh, Captain Kirk, is on the Enterprise, shoo, he zooms past the Earth, I look up, I see his clock as running slow compared to mine. So clocks in relative motion run at different rates. So if we can build a wormhole and have the two ends of the wormhole move at different rates, time will run at different rates at the two ends. And therefore, by going through the wormhole, you could travel to a different time. I should say, this is not theoretical. We, have, we know this is true. Uh, Einstein's theory was proven experimentally back in 1941. All of you use this physics probably every day of your lives. Because every one of you has a smartphone that has a GPS on it. True or false? It's got to be true, right? So we're all used to this. Now, I used to be great at, at remembering maps and things. Now, I, if I don't have my phone in front of me, I don't know where, how to get home. We all use this. Well, that GPS system would crash and burn without making corrections for relativistic effects. Because all of the clocks and all of the GPS satellites are moving relative to us. So how do we make this, this time machine? I've just drawn here two places in space. It makes it seem like space has somehow been folded, but that's just for the, the picture. It could be a flat space. But I've made a wormhole, and I'm making the two ends of the wormhole move relative to each other. And that means, as I say, time is running at different rates between the two ends. And therefore, if you go in one side and come out the other, you come out at a different time. This was first described by Kip Thorne. Uh, some of you may know his name. He was the science guy behind Interstellar, um, Caltech physicist. So time machine could be. Ah, now here's a favorite bit of physics. The inertial, the inertial dampers. I mean, look, time machines and wormholes, that's like crazy stuff. But inertial dampers, all they do is make sure that you don't like get smacked against the wall when you take a hard turn. I mean, here you can see they're, they're banking into the turn here. Right? Surely we must be able to make inertial dampers. What do you think? <laughs> you think? So you're saying, no, it's not possible? This guy's on top of it. Because you know what? You can't make inertial dampers. You can't, there are certain laws of physics you can't beat. Here's what Newton said. You might remember this if you've taken uh, physics in high school or college. Newton said that, that uh, force and acceleration are related to each other. What kind of acceleration do we typically experience on the surface of the Earth? We call that acceleration 1g. It doesn't really matter what it is, 9.8 meters per second squared, but it's 1g. Stand, sit in Earth's gravity, and that's what you're feeling. Uh, if you're on an airplane taking off, you might experience perhaps 0.2g, although it's in the horizontal direction and not the vertical. The guys who are, who are taking off in, in things like the space shuttle, they might experience 3G. Uh, the largest 
acceleration ever experienced by a human being who lived uh, was 46 G. Uh, again, I, I encourage you to, to use that Google thing and look up the video of this guy in that first test of 46 G. Unbelievable. Um, he, he lived, but he was really not a very happy guy. But uh, you know what? <laughs> if, if you're going to do anything on a starship, you're going to experience way more than 46G. And there's nothing that you can do to stop it. That's just the universe. Is that a question, or are you, let's, let's go? What if you could stop matter from interacting with the Higgs field? What if you could stop matter from? Interacting with the Higgs field. Yikes! Okay, uh, <laughs> I, but I, I would say you can't. I mean, in, in, in Star Trek, you know, in science fiction you might, but not in the real world. And that's the thing, uh, and I gotta tell you, so I, I teach this physics, and a lot of it's fun, but I always say, if it's not real physics, it, it's just somebody's, you know, goofy idea. You gotta stick with the, with, with, with the universe, and the universe, just not going to let you get away from this. So if you're going to do any kind of big accelerations, you're going to be a pancake. I, I have to show you this, this little slide because this talk is about all sorts of phantasmic science, which is real. So we have to at least keep ourselves grounded and look at one piece of Star Trek physics, which can't, can't work. All right. Holodecks. Holodecks were invented for the, uh, the second round of Star Trek. They didn't have them originally, uh, but they, the creators of Star Trek needed more potential storylines. <laughs> um, so what was the holodeck? The holodeck was a room. Uh, it, it, it looks like, like this when you don't have any programs running. It's just an empty place. But what can you do with the hollow emitters you can project? whatever scene you want, and not just visually, but you can interact with it. So if you project a, a chair, you can sit in it. Um, if you project someone with a sword, you can fight him. Of course, you have to make sure the interlocks are on so that you can't actually be hurt. Another great set of storylines. <laughs> can we make a holodeck? Could we even imagine it? I mean, oh yes, holograms, yes, no problem. I mean, we've been making and displaying holograms now for six, almost 60 years. Um, what is a hologram? A hologram is a recording of the light waves which bounce off an object. I mean. You're seeing me right now because there are light waves bouncing off of me and going to your eyes. Now these are waves. And that means that if you hold your hand up like this and you move it around while you're looking through a window, you get different views. If you move your head back and forth, you see different alignments, things front and back, in front of and behind each other. And that's what you get with a hologram, because it's recording not the light intensity like you get with a photograph, but the light waves themselves. Now, if you want to make a full, what's called transmission hologram, you not only need a laser to make it, but you need a laser to reconstruct it, to display it. So here is an image uh, from a museum in France of a, a uh, someone holding uh, a transmission hologram which has been imprinted on this cylinder, this transparent cylinder, being reconstructed with a laser beam. And you hold that in your hand and you move around. You see this woman. You see behind her. You see her in different perspective. Because what you're doing is reconstructing the light waves that were originally recorded. Not a whole lot of us have a laser around to reconstruct a hologram. Not only that, but you have to be in a very specific position with respect to the laser and the hologram to see it. 
Well, that doesn't work well for the kind of applications we typically want to use, want to uh, have. Um, so people usually make what's called a reflection hologram. That kind of hologram can be reconstructed with white light. It just doesn't give you a very big depth of field. Some of you may have um, a reflection hologram like, say, on your credit card. Um, you may have seen there you know, shiny little things, and if you tilt your card, you can see just a little bit of perspective. So easy to reconstruct, but you're not going to believe that this is a real world, right? It's not going to look like the holodeck. But at least we can make holograms. But, OK, let's say we could make a great hologram. Uh, how do you make a hologram have substance? Oh, well, you don't have to use a high-powered laser. You don't have to use a high-wattage laser. Yeah. And you spread the light out. But even if we could, I say, even if we could conquer this problem of being able to reproduce a very large sea and then being able to see it from different angles so that you could actually be in a room and just and see the whole world around you projected from a hologram, how could we possibly give it? That, that can't be, right? I mean, holograms is just light. <laughs> Turns out, you can give hologram substance. A lot of people are working on this. Uh, the people probably the most advanced is this uh, group in, in Japan. Um, they are working on something called a visuotactile projector. They project a hologram. And then they used focus ultrasound waves to give tactile uh, response. So you can project holograms of raindrops and stick your hand underneath and feel them hitting your palm. You can play a holographic piano. That's a projection of a keyboard. There's no substance there, but you can feel it and play the keys. And now here is our true test of Google technology. Can I show you this video? What do you think? It's going to work? Oh, it could work. This is from this group in Japan. Uh, the first part's not interesting, but it just shows you their, their setup. And here is a, a, a holographic gecko. And this guy can feel it on his arm, but this is the best part. This is a holographic gecko that's running through a dish of liquid. Look at this. Watch this. Oh my gosh! I mean, is that incredible? So, holodex may be in our future. But let's face it, all that other stuff is just for fun. What's the real deal? Warp drive, right? Why warp drive? Because warp drive is what lets, it get, lets us get someplace far away in a reasonable amount of time. And I mean, shoot, if we can't do that, all the rest of Star Trek falls apart. Now. You may, if, you, if you're not familiar with this physics, you, the Star Trek physics, you may at some point have asked yourself if you know about relativity. You say, well, I know I can't go faster than the speed of light. Einstein said that. So what could possibly get me someplace far away in a short period of time? What could possibly let me go faster than the speed of light? And I'll this is a spoiler alert. Nothing. <laughs> you can't go faster than the speed of light. But we want, we want to go visit Spock. 
He's on Vulcan. Vulcan is very far away, 16 and a half light years. That's uh, oh, around 100,000 billion miles. Uh, Vulcan is a fictitious planet, although it, it orbits a real star. Uh, that star is 40 Aradni A. It was discovered by William Herschel in the late 1700s. Gene Roddenberry endorsed it as the home star of, of uh, Vulcan in the early 90s. It takes a long time for light to get from Earth to Vulcan, so it would take us a really long time. Although I do have to ask the question, is Vulcan near or far? And I have to say, you know what? Vulcan actually is pretty near us on the scale of things. You look up in the, in the sky in the winter and you see Orion. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen Orion in the sky, his famous belt and his dagger, shooting a, a bow. If you're on Vulcan, you could look up into the sky and see Orion, the exact same Orion. The stars look the same in the Vulcan sky. So Vulcan isn't that far away. It's kind of near. Oh, well, it is far. Because um, <laughs> you know what? The fastest humans have been able to go is about 37,000 miles an hour. That's Voyager 1. We launched Voyager 1 in the late 70s. It's now 12 billion miles or so from Earth. So in those many years, it's gone that, yeah, go ahead. Uh, it, n I thought, I thought I no, it, it it has no it has no real sorts of power. Yeah, it is still broadcasting though. Um, it gets a little bit of, of light from the sun, but it's it's distance. Uh, so that number is in miles. It's uh, the way I think of it is um, in what's called astronomical units. One astronomical unit is Earth to Sun. Uh, Voyager is 134 times farther from the sun than Earth is right now. It's outside the limits of the solar system. Um, and it's taken since 1977 to get that far. At that speed, it would take 300,000 years to get to Vulcan. Kind of bad if we want to go visit Spock. And we need a warp drive, but what are the rules? The rules are this. You cannot exceed the speed of light, even on Star Trek. You just can't. You actually don't even want to go close to the speed of light, because if you did, your clock would not run at the same rate at the clocks back home. You go to Vulcan, you come back, everybody you know, dead, dust. That's how much of a difference the time would be. Well, that's really not a very good way to do things. Certainly not for a Star Trek episode. Here's what you have to do. You have to bend a space. Or to use the Star Trek language, you have to warp space. Here's the way I like to imagine it. Imagine, you know those balloons that the clowns make like animals out of, right? And if you squeeze the, squeeze the balloon, Right, squeeze. Imagine that space is like uh, one of these balloons. And here's Earth where we're starting. That's our ship. We want to go to Vulcan. We squeeze the balloon. It pushes the balloon out behind us, squeezes it in in front of us. And hey, suddenly Vulcan is closer and Earth is farther away. If you want to achieve warp travel, you have to squeeze space in front of you, stretch it out behind you. So here's a ship. Look at space in front of it. It's all nice and evenly spaced. But if we can squeeze the space in front and stretch it out behind, maybe do it even more aggressively, suddenly where we, want to, where we, we are where we want to be. You don't have to go fast to do it. Shoot, you could walk to Vulcan. <laughs> so you don't go faster, you just get closer. This is the trick of warp drive. Does not involve the speed of light. 
Oh, but really, come on. Can you really bend the space? We would certainly need a, third, a fourth dimension, because if we have three-dimensional space and you want to bend it, you need a fourth dimension to bend it into. Is that possible? How would we even know if it were possible? I mean, look around the world. I don't see four dimensions. I do see four dimensions. Here's how I know. I look for, for light rays that are cheating. See, light rays have to go straight. If you find a light ray that's not going straight, it do something about the fourth dimension that we might not know. Einstein actually proposed this just after the turn of the century, the last century. He said, massive objects must bend space-time. To do that, there has to be a fourth dimension to bend space-time into. Here's how we would see it, he says. Imagine a big massive object that could bend space-time. And far, far beyond it is a, an object, say a star. We can't see the star because the light from the star gets blocked by this big object. Of course, light from the star is going out in all directions, including this direction. But light from this direction, if it gets caught up by the bending of space, might end up coming back toward Earth anyway. Now, we don't know that. We just look out and see light coming toward us. So we say, well, where is that light coming from? We trace a straight line back. And we say the star is out here. Except some of the light from the star could have come in another direction and bent back. Goes, gosh, we see two or three or four or multiple images. This is what Einstein proposed. It was experimentally verified in 1919 by looking at stars close to the sun during a solar eclipse when you could see those stars that were so close to the sun and you could see that their path was being bent by the curvature of space. They're called either Einstein rings or Einstein crosses. Here's an example of an Einstein cross. These four objects are the same star. That star is directly behind this massive uh, quasar. Uh, yeah. Why are there only four? Who said that? Why are there only four? Well, let, let me show you this picture, then I'll answer your question. This is also one star directly behind that guy. So now you might say, well, why are there an infinite number? And the answer is it's just geometry. So it just it, the, the two things are not exactly lined up. And depending on quite how the alignment is determines where exactly you get the images. If it's, per, if it's like perfect alignment, you get a beautiful circle. If it's close, you get an almost beautiful circle. And if it's off a little bit, you get dots, sometimes two, three, mostly four. So what do these Einstein rings and Einstein crosses tell us? They tell us that space can be warped into four dimensions. Can we make warp drive? Well, the first paper on warp drive was published in 1994. Miguel Alcubierre, he's um, a physicist at the University of Mexico. He published this first paper in the Classical, uh, classical and Quantum Gravity Journal, which if you go pick up a copy sometime, uh, like for me anyway, I look at it. I can understand the titles typically of the papers. <laughs> That's it. This is part of the abstract. I reproduce it because in his abstract, he uses this phrase, warp drive of science fiction. And this is the best part. When he was interviewed a few years later and asked why he originally thought about investigating this, he said, I was watching Star Trek, and I thought there must be a way to do this right. right? A lot of papers have been written on the subject since then. There are physicists who call warp drive Alcubierre drive because of his work. <laughs> 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 the 
the invention of warp drive. On the left, Zephram Cochran demonstrated warp drive in April of 2063. I'm, so you, I'm sure many of you saw the documentary. <laughs> Star Trek First Contact. And on the right, there he is. That's Miguel Alcubierre. <laughs> now, can we do it? First of all, it takes a heck of a lot of power. So much power that the only way to generate that much power is through matter-antimatter reactions. Now, we do make antimatter. Uh, right up the street at the Sanford Linear Accelerator. Not only do we make it, but it's being made for us. There's some antimatter in you right now. Um, particularly if you eat salt or oranges or bananas, all those have a lot of potassium. Salt substitute, whoosh, lots of potassium. About one in every 10,000 potassium atoms is radioactive, uh, potassium 40. About once every 10,000 times that radioactive potassium decays, it creates an antimatter electron. So for example, uh, the potassium in a banana, you get maybe one antimatter electron every couple of hours. The potassium that you have in your body that's probably about 200 grams. You get maybe 100 antimatter electrons an hour being made in your body. And as you know from watching Star Trek, as Scotty was always freaking out about the matter-antimatter engines overloading, you know, and uh, those antimatter electrons being created in your body, as soon as they encounter an electron, they annihilate. Psh, explosion. Well, tiny little explosion. So nothing to worry about. Okay, so we do make antimatter. At SLAC, they're making about 0.1 trillion antimatter electrons per year. Sounds like a lot. Well, if you consider the fact that it takes 3 trillion matter, uh, you know, electron, antimatter electron collisions just to light a flashlight, probably we don't have enough antimatter just yet to make warp drive. It's possible, in theory. You squeeze space in front of you, you stretch it out behind you. You don't have to go fast, but you end up far away. You can go someplace far away. It takes a lot of power. Please. Oh. Uh, under warp drive, you could be going very slowly. Now, if, you need, if, you, if you've been attacked by mm, the Romulans and you're making a hard bank to get away from them, then you're getting squished like a pancake. But you're, you're right. If you're, not going, if you're not accelerating rapidly, then yeah, you don't have to worry about that. So my summary. Uh, the physics of Star Trek. Mirror universes, hey, maybe. Tractor beams, we're already doing it. Wormholes, theoretically possible. Time travel, theoretically possible. Inertial dampers, seems like the simplest piece of this, no. Holodecks, eh, sort of. Warp drive, in theory. I think this is a great start, great start to the future, and I leave you with this. Diftor Hesmuzma, live long and prosper. And if you take only one thing away from this talk, take away that last line, because there in fact is a proper response to live long and prosper. It is peace and long life. Socha Ediv. Thanks very much. Uh, a couple of decades ago, Lawrence Krauss had a uh, 
similarly titled book where you sort of inspire, or the same, it was using the it, same title, The Physics of Star Trek. Physics of Star Trek. And in fact, that. I teach a course at Santa Clara called The Physics of Star Trek, and his book is the required text for my ah, class. Okay, okay, okay. It's a great, if you have not looked, so you, you've looked, you read the book? Have you looked at I've it? I've looked at it, yeah. If you have not read this book, you have to go buy it. First of all, it's, it's small, and it's like this thick, and every page is fun. So you have to, you have to buy this book. Yeah, it's fantastic. Subspace communication, a similar problem to warp drive, and is that possibly an easier problem? So I'm fascinated by the idea of subspace. Uh, you, you would think that subspace is, uh, again, just a sort of a, a, a staple of science fiction. But, but I think of subspace this way. I, I, this is my own idea. I haven't read this anywhere. But uh, if, space, if we consider space to be four-dimensional, we live in a three-dimensional space. So we clearly are living in a three-dimensional slice of four space. But there are other three-dimensional slices besides ours if there are four dimensions. And so one could imagine that we could use one of those other three-dimensional slices for, say, communication, subspace. So I actually, I think that um, subspace is not, uh, communication is not out of the question. Yeah. So what about those food replicators in Star Trek? Yeah. You know, T, Earl Grey, hot. So I did not talk about replica. Well, replicators are really a low-res form of transporter beams, and I, I didn't. I, I chose not to 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 address them. But uh, let me just say a couple of things. First of all, uh, physicists have been operating transporter beams since the light, uh, the late 1990s. Uh, not quite the Star Trek transporter beams, but but transporter beams nevertheless. However. If you sit down and ask yourself how much data is required to, to record and move, well, sh sh certainly if you ask, if you want to get into transporter beam and I'll pop out in Paris for lunch kind of thing, the amount of data required for a person would require, if you, if you, if you stored all that data on, on stick drives, and by the way, do you, you know you can get like a terabyte stick drive now, right? Huge. It would take covering the entire surface of the Earth, water and land, four meters deep in terabyte stick drives to record one person. So, so how much data would you need to do your Earl Grey tea? Not that much, but still a lot. It's a hard problem from the data perspective. So what you're saying is we need better compression algorithms. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, well, okay, you might do that for Earl Grey tea. I don't think I want you to compress me, though. I don't, I don't want any loss of resolution. <laughs> um, so I think Dr. Uh, Harold White at NASA is working on trying to use energy to bend space. Um, are you at all familiar with the experiments that he's doing? I, I am not. Okay. Um, uh, but... I, I, I guess to sort of take in on face value, energy and mass are the same, yeah. uh, as Einstein told us, equals mc squared. So, I mean, I have, I have no problem imagining that, you know, you could use energy in the same way as mass to, to curve space. Okay. And additionally, um, so a problem with space travel today is that planets travel at different speeds. So even if you can get there, like with the Pluto flyby that we did last year, um, even if you can get there, you have to slow down after you get there. Is that still a problem with warp drive? No. No, no it's not. Because again, in warp drive, you are not really moving. Particularly. You don't have to move at all if you didn't want to. Because you're squeezing space as opposed to traveling fast. Okay. So acceleration is not required for warp drive. Yeah, I was, I was speaking more about like the difference in velocity between different planets, which I imagine between different star systems would be greater. Yeah, and you know, drop it out of warp has always been something that they kind of hand yeah. wave around. Um, I, I would say, I would say it, you know, sort of on the surface, no. But since you're not accelerating, you can just drop out and match whatever speed you want to match the planet or whatever. Okay. How fast could you bend space? Seems like if you couldn't bend it fast, it's not a real useful idea. You bend it a lot, you mean? No, how fast could you bend it? Well, how, oh, how long does it take? 
I'm, yes. I'm just... So you're saying, oh, look, I could bend space. I can make these two things appear closer. But like, how fast could you do it? Oh, uh, well, if, if you look at the Alcubierre's paper, uh, so what he's talking about, and this is what people think is the, is the right approach for uh, warp drive, is to bend space only within a local bubble around your ship or whatever you want to call it. So you, you're, not, you're not bending space all the way from here to Vulcan, you're just bending space locally around you, which, which is a very fast process, assuming you have the energy to do it. And it takes, it takes some funky energy, I have to say. It's not just a lot of energy. It also takes negative energy, which is kind of funky. But, but physicists have created negative energy. So we, we know that that's possible. Again, not on the scale that you need for warp drive, but we have done it. So, but yeah, you don't have to do it over long distances. So it doesn't have to be, it's not a time-consuming time process. Okay. Uh, can you speculate what could be the physics of uh, alternating the frequency of the shield to block attacks? Oh, shields? Yeah. Well, I mean, energy can be focused. I mean, we do this, uh, I showed you the optical tweezers, for example. So you could imagine focusing some form of energy. After all, acoustic waves are energy, although they don't travel through space, but light. Um, I think the kind of shields that we see in Star Trek, this thing that goes around the ship, uh, probably unlikely. But um, a defense shield where you focus energy on something that's coming towards you, that's not at all unreasonable. Um, and, and the amount of energy that you need is actually well within the range of something we could even do today. Those used to be Star Wars model. Shoot lasers at it. Not Star Wars the movie, Star Wars the, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, we could we, we could talk a lot about this, this that, that Star Wars model. Interesting physics, very very difficult to make real, but yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kesting. Yeah.